we are joined by two gentlemen. Peter Chalo is the director of ICT of the Judiciary, and Joseph Karanja is the deputy director ICT operations, the same institution, the Judiciary. Peter, Josfat, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the hot seats of the Situation Room. Karibuni sana. Thank you. Mambo ya judiciary kwaje? Usalama. Iko sawa. Kazi. It's all digital. Yes. You've all gone digital. Yes. <laughs> They've done a very big thing. Gone digital. But to welcome you to the conversation, City will give you the day's proverb. Yes. See, the proverbs this week are from? The Republic of Burundi. Mm. Um, a rich man who does not know himself is worth less than a poor man who does. A rich man who does not know himself is worth less than a poor man who knows who does. Yes. Okay. Peter, how do you interpret this proverb? Uh, <laughs> so I, I would say that uh, a rich man mm. and a poor man, you see, it's, uh, it's about knowing your potential. You sit on your potential, you don't use it, then uh, you are worth less than that person who doesn't know their potential, but they are doing their best. Mm. I, I think that would be my interpretation. Good one. Just for what's yours? I would say, uh, what, what, what are you defining as a rich man? Is it rich by money? So it means if you don't know yourself, then you can easily lose what you have. But if you are poor, but you know yourself, it means you can build on what you have to be rich mm. so it's better to be poor but know yourself rather than rich which you can lose a minute those are very beautiful interpretations mm. yes mm. you know the thing about interpreting a proverb you can't possibly be wrong because it is your interpretation mm. but both interpretations are very good they're Excellent. spot on spot on Kabisa. spot on they actually speak and they tell us a lot yes okay I'm going to read um, a statement. The Chief Justice Martha Kome recently launched the e-filing in all courts countrywide and directed that no court should print pleadings and documents from the 1st of July this year. Go to court, no paper, paper at you, printer, image, kuja kesha, nothing like that anymore. In the same event held at the Supreme Court grounds, the CJ also unveiled a new cost list portal where litigants and advocates can get information on cases listed for the day. Also launched was a data tracking dashboard that will assist judiciary leaders to monitor case proceedings within court from filing to conclusion. This marks a giant leap in the commitment to transforming how, to how we deliver justice through the strategic use of technology in alignment with the social transformation through access to justice blueprint of the judiciary. The CJ added that the judiciary's goal is to enhance productivity, automate processes, digitize services, and establish a paperless environment, thereby making justice more accessible, reducing the geographical barriers to accessing justice. It's all digital. It's all gone digital. The two gentlemen in the studio this morning are the ones who have that task of ensuring that this works. If you go to court from the 1st of July, when we system go down, these oh. two gentlemen <laughs> will be answerable. <laughs> if you're told, oh, Sasa, you know, we have to now print because they, 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 these two gentlemen, so they're here to tell us what they're doing about it. Peter Chalo, director of ICT, and your deputy director, Jos Joseph Karanja. So let's start with you, Peter. What is the whole, what's the genesis of this journey? I mean, by the time the, chi the chief justice was unveiling these moves, a lot of work has taken place and a lot of thinking has gone behind it. What's the thinking behind it? You see, um, this journey started a while back. Uh, I would say it's work that has been happening for a long period of time. If I, if I could take you back to the year 2005, I think that's the first time when we started automating. Uh, and you know courts are very conservative in the way they do their work. Mm. So it's around this period when um, the strategic plan then, 2005-2008, uh, one of the items in that plan mm. was to automate the judiciary to make sure that uh, we can do e-filing. Uh, but of course, that didn't take place mm. uh, until 2008, uh, when now we onboarded ICT officers. At the time, it was, a, it was not a judiciary project. It was anchored to the high court. Mm. And uh, it was until, I think, uh, 
during the time of uh, the former chief justice Willy Mutunga mm. when now we started transforming the judiciary through the judicial transformation framework mm. uh, so more efforts were put in place uh, and you remember we were trying to change internally our processes our people and um, when uh, the other chief justice that is uh, justice uh, uh, David, David Maraga. Maraga came in, mm. continued with the same efforts. And one of the good things that happened then is that a committee was set up. Uh, it's a committee that uh, will deal with the automation of courts, case management. And this committee started working. Mm. Uh, and uh, the first thing was to come up with policies. You know, you're introducing uh, technology in a, in a background where it, it's all about law. <coughs> so, so it was not uh, an easy exercise. Mm. Uh, so we needed policies. That is when we now started developing. The first ICT policies were, I think, drafted and approved in 2018. And then that's when we started now doing the system that we launched recently. Uh, so I, I would say it's been a journey, but uh, COVID is a thing that now made everything happen. Mm -hmm. There were systems, uh, but things were not moving. But now with COVID, we all had to jump in and make sure that court processes uh, continue. Mm -hmm. So, so that has been the journey, and uh, as you can see, it has been work over uh, many years. Uh, most importantly, with the leadership that is supporting and promoting the same. Chief Justice, the uh, current Mother Koome, unlike the other two, you know, the approach now is looking outward. Mm. Study is all about looking at the marginalized, the vulnerable, and making sure that now we at least improve access to justice, ensure the distance to court is less than 100 kilometers. Uh, and that is why you see the virtual courts, the e-filing, uh, a lot of other in initiatives like transcription mm. that have taken place. So building on what has been done since 2012, now we've made our process internally. You will notice that uh, the CTS, the case tracking system, mm. has been in operation in all the courts since the year 2020, July 1st, 2020. Mm. That has been internal. Mm -hmm. But now the e-filing, which is outward looking, now connects us now to the public. Um, uh, and that's why uh, recently we, we launched that so that now uh, litigants across the country can be able to file from the comfort of their homes, from any location, anywhere in the world, any time of the day. So we are now 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, you can now apply for a certificate of urgency later and before you realize it has been responded to. And so we now see our judges working even overnight. And that is the journey. We just want to make sure that... Uh, as enablers, you know, I sit in the judiciary, you are enablers, mm. just to make sure that that dream of access to justice is realized. Is realized. Among the people that we know and has been here and has told us that uh, he's taken advantage of e-filing is Dr. Magaragi Kenyi, <laughs> who has, for example, now taken another case to court on affordable housing. He says he files these things at about midnight from his home in Nakuru, and by morning, he's receiving responses from the judiciary. Now, what's the importance of e-filing, Josphat? Um, thank you. E-filing, one, gives access, as Peter said, to citizens. It, it, it opens the doorways, increases our access to justice by our citizens. And two, you don't have to come to court. You don't have to leave your office. You don't have to leave your home. So you will scan your documents, you will upload, and we will be able to deal with them. So that removing that physical barrier, physical access to court is very, very important because mm. it, the, it comes with many, many challenges. But if you can file any time, so again, you don't have to be, you know, you, at, you have to come at in the morning at 8. No, no, any time you are ready with your documents, we even allow that you can build a case online. You can continue up compiling your documents and then once you are there, the case is complete then you submit so e-filing gives us access gives access you don't have to be in the country from wherever you are you can file your documents to court mm. and then with the complementary uh, service of virtual courts then it means you can even participate to court again virtually without coming to court mm. so it gives mm. that uh, and you can file to any court you mm. don't have to drive to to fly to mombasa to file mm. you can file to mombasa as you said on the case of daktari mm. from nakuru and you will file at the constitutional court in Nairobi. Okay. Is this complete digitizing? Because um, one would imagine that, yes, you can file, 
um, um, electronically. You don't have to appear. We can now see court sessions happening um, in a virtual manner, right? But does it go end to end? Because then we don't. We, we still see, if we look at the process of the court, we still see magistrates and judges yes. uh, writing. We still see piles and piles of files making their way into court. So how will that process play out where we can say the system really then is digitized from end to end? Is that part of, is that part of the plan or does it not uh, p feature here? It is part of the plan. Mm -hmm. You will notice that uh, recently we only launched in 34 counties, mm -hmm. meaning we were live in the other 13, 13 years. And um, the reason why we had uh, initially Nairobi for two years, then we went to Mombasa, and then we went to areas that we consider uh, marginalized in terms of uh, resources. Mm. We went to Mandera, we went to Garissa, Wajia, we went to Samburu, we went to uh, Turkana County. Lodo. Yes. Mm. The reason was uh, we wanted to understand those dynamics in, in terms of are we really ready to roll out in the country we are looking at the issues of power yeah mm -hmm. uh, and power we have stations that are not uh, within the grid the kplc grid mm -hmm. and we need to understand these uh, challenges we also need a time to scan our documents you, you know we have a lot of our physical files and we need to scan them so that uh, they are now in the system mm -hmm. um ideally to, to make sure that once we go live, you have all your documents, complete files, uh, fully uh, fully scanned and accessible in the system. Mm. But uh, part of the lessons learned is uh, what you are talking about. We still see judges uh, right. Uh, uh, but you see, it when you bring change, and especially if it is technology, the other aspects of change management, mm. you have to change the people before you change the organization. Mm. It's a journey. Yeah, it's a journey. We must appreciate that um, our judicial officers and judges are different ages in terms of even technology. It has been a journey as training them. But what I can tell you is that um, the vision now of moving fully paperless on 1st of July mm. will be accomplished because after the pilot, after activating the 13 counties for the last over one year, we have learned some lessons. Mm. And we know how to, to go about them. Mm. We now understand why they actually write. Mm. Yeah. And that is why other than what we launched recently, we are also parallel doing a transcription center, which is also transcribing for them. Many if you get into a virtual court session, yeah. all you need is to sit and listen. There's a system back end that will transcribe for you and give you the notes. Mm. So you see, as we continue now to roll out the transcription country as well, that uh, issue of writing, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think by 1st of July, uh, it will be a thing of the past. Mm. Yes. So then gone are the days whereby, I mean, obviously with this system, uh, Joseph, gone are the days by when people would turn up to court and uh, a file would be missing. Or we cannot locate a file because yeah. it took a walk. I don't know where. <laughs> uh, but we're saying now with this, and because they now they've been saved and stored, w such problems would cease to exist? It's true. Uh, yeah. The issue of missing files has been a challenge for a long time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that this will cure, you know, a court file is built by collecting documents from many parties. You have what the past the litigant is filing. Mm -hmm. You have what the respondents are filing. Mm -hmm. You have what is coming out of court and other uh, extra documents. So that forms the court file. So with this e-filing, we are allowing all these parties to file their documents and upload their documents. Then the system should assemble this file and make it available mm -hmm. for future use. So one, we deal away with, with the issue of the physical file is missing. Then number two, as Peter has said, why we were given until July 1 is now how do we make this file accessible to our judges? Because you see those volumes, mm. it means even when you scan, you're dealing with a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. So you need, you need to make it very simple for a judicial officer, for an advocate to be able to access that document. Mm. And that's why that issue of 1st of July, so that we figure out these piles of documents, how do we make them accessible mm. quickly?
when a court process is going on. So the, we will deal with the issue of missing file and also make it even easier and quicker mm -hmm. to access. So if you go to the e-filing portal, mm -hmm. you will find there is an information kiosk. So besides us allowing people to file, uh -huh. we've also provided a public information kiosk so you can get even um, access to information about a case, any case without again coming to court. Uh, There's a public so the public information, information kiosk is like yes. a library? It's like a library, it's like an, an ATM. Mm. You key in the case number and it will give it you the you details the about the case. Okay. Yes. Paint for us the picture, please, yes. of the 2nd of July this year. Okay? Yes. Somebody has a criminal case. Paint for us a picture. Somebody has a civil case. Paint for us a picture. And then the others, land case. Okay. An em employment and la labor relations case. Okay. Or what's happening in this e filing digital mm, okay. system? Just take us through. Mm. Yes. Mm. Let me uh, check you through the you know, case. Maybe mm. Karanja will take the civil. Mm. Uh, the journey of automation in the judiciary is a collaboration between many stakeholders. One of the key stakeholders is the ODPP. You, we have been working with the ODPP for some time. And they have a system we call as Wadilifu. And this is where all criminal charges Sorry, are filed. What again? Wadilifu. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a system known as Wadilifu by the ODPP. Meaning? Uh, Wadilifu is diligence? Yes. Yes. Diligence. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens is that uh, um, our system, I, I told you our system, the e-filing system is the public facing part of our case tracking system. Mm. But internally what we see is what we call as the case tracking system. It's just one same system, mm. just that one faces the public, the other one faces the, on our side is internal facing. So the Wadilif system from the ODPP interacts directly, integrates directly with the CTS. So what happens is that uh, when they are... Um, matters from the police mm -hmm. for they also play a major part mm -hmm. they are processed through the odpp yes the odpp will decide whether to they will make a decision to charge or not to mm -hmm. but when they finally make a decision to charge they file through the wadilif system mm -hmm. which is a, a system run by odpp we don't even have access mm -hmm. but the moment they file um on their side it automatically is pulled from our side to our side mm -hmm. And we immediately, in a matter of microseconds, we assign them a case number. Mm -hmm. That is how criminal cases get to our side, to, to the side of the judiciary. So Eric is being charged by the DPP. Yes. The DPP files this through his Wadilifu yes. and posts it into the judiciary. Then immediately the judiciary assigns a case number. The system assigns a case assigns number. Yes, a case number. Uh -huh. So once uh, the CTS system assigns a case number, yeah. the ODPP, they are able to, to see the case number. And that uh, case is uh, filed, and then it proceeds like the rest of the cases, not through CTS. Uh, more documents can be filed. Okay. Um, the law firms, uh, the, even the lead card can be able to, to file more documents. And the process continues now in CTS until such a time when it is disposed. So what is happening now next? After the case number, Yes. what happens next? So is it considered that the DPP has charged me? Yes, they have officially charged you. Already, now we process. I've been in charged. Court. Yes. Okay. Now the court now starts processing, and I'll, so next thing is the system assigns a date for hearing, for mentions, for all yes. these things. Yes. And the rest of the activities take place mm. um, as we as the sessions continue until such a time when you are either sentenced or freed. Okay. The rest happens now on the side of judiciary. In between this, if I come to court and I'm to be released on bond and bail. Yes. Right? So how does that now work? So I've come in, so bond and bail have been set. Mm -hmm. I am, of course, being processed and being held by the correctional services yes. people as the registrar is doing all those things. What we know is that there's a file that's going to be taken to the registry and then that invoice is going to be generated. It'll be given an invoice. So how does this happen all without printing any paper? So, um, some of the changes that uh, we've done recently, and you remember that we have uh, a gazette notice, we have guidelines on uh, faster processing of cash bills and fines, uh, which is what we've been trying to automate. So what's going to change is that uh, we'll move from uh, the paper files, uh, we'll also move from that scenario where you come in the morning, then all of you maybe take plea, then you are processed late in the day. Yeah. So what, is, what will happen right now is case by case. You are processed, if you are to pay, 
it is sent you get an invoice to your your phone or your email mm -hmm. and somebody else can pay for you from wherever they are mm -hmm. they can actually pay for you mm -hmm. so so you see it is not going to be as complex as it has been manual so you see currently you need to get uh, that invoice you need to make the payment yep. there's a lot of printing yeah so the guidelines are that we are supposed to provide a computer in all those plea taking courts yeah. mm -hmm. so that uh, the second court assistant is able to process you uh, to, to process your payment uh, to just to enable you to, to pay and and you don't have to wait for the rest of the people okay so our system will be able to send alerts um, send you an invoice to your email to your mm. phone it can be forwarded to somebody else to pay for you mm. it doesn't have to be in that court mm. actually while in Nairobi you can pay for somebody in Mombasa that is where we are going to i just need so, to forward the invoice to them yes and they process using the number is a pay bill that they pay. is uh, the number that you are supposed to pay for the moment you pay it goes to the bank bank updates our system mm -hmm. it appears on our side that you paid and you're freed mm. that's it that's it what about in the cases when i need to produce a surety a bond or surety so i've come with a logbook or a title deed mm. how do i lodge that it's going to be the same process uh, I have, it needs I have to, to scan them yes they need to be scanned into the system mm. of course they need to be verified first of all <laughs> yes they will need to be verified then uh -huh. uh, they are scanned and they get part of the document that have been filed in the system the rest of the process is the law it doesn't change then you are freed it's just that we're moving from manual to mm. putting into the system every time we talk about uh, a system such as one we're discussing mm. The thing that really concerns me is what happens when it fails maybe you could go back and ask what have we done so that the system is not down then we'll see as peter said this has been a journey mm. so we've taken the precautions to make sure that this system is 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 stable and it is very uh it, it will always be available so we run multiple data centers we we have it in it is well designed mm. it is it is well protected as much as it can be protected but in case it goes down mm. we we've identified that uh, one it could go down national we could have a national outage so we've put in place what we call uh, offline mode is a way for us to be able to process court <coughs> documents especially um time bound matters you know mm. your court says you have to file this by six o'clock maybe mm. you have to pay your bond by six o'clock so time bound matters uh, certificates of urgency uh, those ones are able to, we are able to file them there's a way we open, we manage them um through a manual process for that short time mm. and in a way that when the system comes back online we'll be able to integrate them back to the system mm -hmm. so that makes sure that uh, we are able to continue processing system could go down when people are waiting to be released on bond we yeah. want them to go back to to, to, to prison demand. or to jail so that we're able to process even when the payment process goes down again we have many channels of accepting payment even pesa is not working you can directly go to the bank and as long as you have your case reference number the payment reference number you'll be able to pay you can go to an agency so we've provided multiple ways of paying i just look at which points at which points can cause uh, the system to fail. to fail yeah okay how do you align with other agencies that you require information from um through cases but then are not digitized or have not gone through and i think of i mean you mentioned some of them where you might have from the police for example who have files from here to timbuktu in paper form and now you're saying the judiciary is digitized but they still have the heavy files yeah how do you then do that whether it is odpp whether it is the police whether it is prisons, uh, prisons they're not digitized but they are the f agencies that you deal with every day for the court process so as as the cj said mm. it's e-filing for everyone so mm -hmm. even agencies mm. all have to comply now remember we work under ncj national council on administration of justice mm -hmm. so most of these agencies are within especially for criminal uh, justice sector mm -hmm. and the advocates they are represented in uh, ncj so if the agency does not have a system like we have with the odpp and we deliver mm -hmm. where we can integrate mm -hmm. then we create accounts for them just like we do for the advocates on e-filing mm -hmm. so they'll open an account and then they'll file through that account mm -hmm. and if you watch when we are launching the first presentation was from gariza prison 
So the prison has an account, all prisons have accounts, mm -hmm. and they're able to file for the prisoners uh, on their appeals and all. So all agencies will be expected to create an account. But the encouragement is that all agencies, all our agencies will be creating their internal uh, case filing systems, and then we can integrate. But for now, anybody who needs to file, we work with them, we assist them, we train to create an account, and then through those accounts, then they're able to file e-filing. So there are no exceptions on who can file. So luckily for the police and most of the criminal justice sector actors, they go through the ODPP. Mm. Most of them have to file through the ODPP. Mm. A few come through directly. Um, EACC sometimes, they'll file directly so they get their filing accounts. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the police file through the ODPP. Mm -hmm. So if they are witness statements, uh, charge sheets, they have to be scanned, uploaded to the ODPP, and then the ODPP, once they make a decision to charge, then that file is transmitted to the case tracking system. Okay. Right. One would imagine then that the burden of care then rests with you when it comes to the protection of the data that comes in. Because everything, everything, your age, date of birth, where you live, if you filed anything in court, one would imagine that has to do with the case and all your information is there. Mm. We had a conversation a couple of days with uh, uh, the Commission of Data Protection and uh, that's one of the questions that comes in and the judiciary is one of those where we say okay well a lot of information lies here how does protection come in for the information that i mean is vast um that's with you yes <coughs> so um data is very important to us i remember we actually collecting a lot of information by the time you successful file a case mm -hmm. it means then uh, you've keyed in a lot of information and um, we have a lot of stakeholders, like Aranja said, but there are some stakeholders who file very sensitive documents. I'm talking about the witness protection, mm. probation, mm. Uh, ch children. children. So these are matters that, uh, yes, they are filed like the others, but the way they appear on our side, the way we take care of them is not like the other documents. Mm -hmm. There are some which can only be seen by the judicial officer not even the registry staff. Mm. There are those that, uh, again, cannot be filed very early. They Sometimes they file just before the case, or maybe the day before, and they go straight to the judge or the judicial officer. And, and therefore, we are taking care of, of such, making sure that uh, even internally, that information goes to the right people. Now, with regard to data protection, we are trying to establish redundancy. Karanja talks about uh, data centers, and... Um, we have policies in place, policies about data, policies about disaster recovery and business continuity, just to make sure that uh, not just protecting the data, but ensuring that uh, there is also continuity, just should anything happen. Mm. And uh, we, we try to make sure that um, where our data centers are located, um, again, they, they are also uh, secure. Uh, in our systems, in terms of privacy, you can only file if you have an account. Okay. Yes. And you access documents that are to do with the case that you're handling. Same to our judicial officers, you only get to see cases that you're handling, mm. and nothing outside that. And uh, this is very important because it ensures privacy. If you are updating outcomes, you're adding activities to the case, again, it, it's you to do it. And we really track all activities in the system so that at least we are also accountable on this happened, we know exactly who transacted. Uh, and so we are able to, to some good level, assure of privacy and confidentiality of the data that is, is filed. Mm. Mm. It's an area, um, if you consider the field of cyber security, is an area that you must keep on improving. Mm. Okay. It's not an area you'll do today and say we are good. So what you I, can can officers of the court at whatever level access the system outside of the court, outside of the judiciary offices? Yes. Authorized officers okay. access these systems through a virtual private network. Okay. Mm. And that means uh you will need access to our network through VPN. Then again, you'll need access to the system through username and password, through um, a two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're able to access, but through a secure channel. Mm -hmm. okay. All the way. Yeah.
There are two gentlemen that uh, I always remember. One is called Joseph Munguti and another is called Benjamin Macau. These two gentlemen are journalists and they were court reporters in the 90s when they introduced me to court reporting. You go to court, you sit, you are hearing the proceedings as they go on and you're recording. You're hearing what the uh, people are saying in court. You record that. Now, if we start going virtual and we have all these things, how is it going to work for journalists? and other people would like to report on proceedings of cases in court. Okay. So, um, so when you talk of virtual, we, we are talking of um, us sharing a link between our judicial officers and uh, the parties to the case who are supposed to attend. This case, uh, that's where we launched the course list. The link is actually there open to the public, mm -hmm. and you can always join. So you can be able to join and you follow the proceeding. It's just that we control on who can talk uh, at what time. A and for me, it's much easier. We are the constraint of smaller courtrooms. Mm. Now with the link, mm -hmm. I, I believe it's <coughs> even more open for to the media mm. to, to, to be able to access, join, and be part of the conversation. You can follow. Um, From the comfort of your newsroom yes. desk. I see. So basically what we're saying is that anybody in the country, if you just check the cost mm. list and you see a case that's of interest to you, you click the link and you can follow proceedings. Yes. Yes. I and, see. And, and also, um, I would add, uh, mm. if you notice, every time we have a case which is of national importance, special arrangements are made mm. so that it's either streamed or, or set up in a situation where we can give access to more journalists. Okay. But yes. And two, We'll be able also, at request, you can even get a recording of a case. If there's a case you really want, through the court, uh, you make a request, you can avail the recording mm. for other work. The idea here is yeah. to make justice more accessible yes. 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 using digital platforms. Yes. Is it going to be just as accessible and as, as easy for, let's say, somebody is going to the small claims court, people are using the alternative justice systems, people are going to um, various tribunals, how is this going to work? Um, I, I've, I believe it's going to be easy uh, in a number of ways. First, it's going to be easy to access justice uh, because first you don't need to travel. Let's start from there. Mm. You need to access uh, maybe a service in the court. Um, start with the filing. You can file online. That is the easiest way of accessing uh, maybe justice. Mm. Previously, if you had a case, say, in Mbita, and we all know where Mbita is, mm. you have to travel all the way to Mbita. Mm. Um, virtual courts makes it easier. You can access even from your home. Filing online, paying online, following the outcomes of, of your, your case online, again, makes it very easy for you to access justice. Mm. And remember, this is one of the main ways that we are doing. Remember, we're also doing mediation. Mm. Yeah. 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 We are also doing uh, AJS. Uh, and uh, we, we are trying to coordinate all of them and make sure that they are working. They, they are alternative means of accessing justice. Mm. They, they are many of them. So when you combine technology and, and other um, options that are there to access justice, for me, when you reduce the distance to court, when you provide multi dolls, when you provide many options, it's it, it, it's providing more access than before. Mm. Yes. What about in cases now where you have poor connectivity? Of course, your system is robust. It's uh, working very well. But from our end, from the user's end, mm. the user has poor connectivity. They are live in court. Um, the judicial officer can't hear them. That's going to really impact the mm. proceedings in court. So what are you going to do about that? We, that has been a challenge, and that's why I told you we started with the worst case scenario, Mandera, Lodua, mm. and we wanted to understand the challenge. It can be worst in those regions. Mm. And we were saying, if it works in Mandera, if it works in Lodua, it will work in Machakos, Kajiado, because we have better infrastructure there. But we still have issues of uh, internet. Mm. And internet is affected by many factors if there's no power then most likely there's no internet mm -hmm. yeah there's no internet and so one of the 
well, one of the measures that we've put in place is to ensure that we also collaborate with the um, other government agencies. The Ministry of ICT, the ICT Authority, the Communication Authority have been very helpful to us. In fact, day to day we work very closely. You will notice that uh, right now we have slightly above 137 court stations. And what we've done is that we worked very closely with the ICT Authority. 78 of those are on fiber, the NOFB, National Optic Fiber Infrastructure. Mm. So that becomes our secondary link for internet. Primary link is, as, uh, is provided by other service providers. So what happens is that it means when you are down, the, the secondary link takes over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are doing just to make sure that uh, at least it's stable. In um, stations which are far off, I'm talking of Kakuma, for example, we have arrangements with the ISP of uh, if, for instance, the main line is not working, we have the option of modems. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we put measures in place to also provide them with the laptops to ensure that uh, once, you know, once they are charged, they, they can stay at least for a long time. Mm -hmm. The judiciary also recently, because remember, as you say, we are going um, e-filing countrywide. You also have to put measures in place for sustainability. And one of the other major projects uh, that is upcoming is the solar project. The judiciary leadership has made a decision that all court stations are going to be on solar. Mm -hmm. uh, that decision came last year. As we speak, we've done solar in 40 stations. 40? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I told you we have around 137. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of time. We'll cover all of them. And the idea here is to make sure that solar is our primary source of power. We are doing it in the commercial way, not just putting a panel and a battery. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. fully the commercial way of doing it. Yeah. You have a station that is serving uh, both lighting and uh, uh, the sockets. Mm -hmm. So so that makes sure that uh, we support all our equipment. Our equipment, again, are on our UPS. So, so you see, it, it's quite a system. You have the KPLC, you have solar, and again, your UPS. Mm -hmm. This way, um, and the good thing is that a better part of the country we have good supply of, uh, of sun yes mm -hmm. <laughs> and the technology in this area is also improving mm -hmm. so it's a challenge now but but uh, it's a challenge that i see by end of next year uh, i don't think it will be a challenge mm -hmm. yes and, and maybe to add um remember we are not in isolation as a judiciary mm -hmm. so in these things that we do we look out what are our partners counterparts in government doing so as peter said if north if the ministry is working on north B, then we work closely with them and tell them, look, this station is having a challenge. If we have stations which are really facing serious challenges with connectivity, uh, that being the area of the communication authority, mm -hmm. so we're able to reach out to them and they will help us to strengthen that area mm -hmm. uh, and improve. And, and, and as even as we speak, we have a project we are doing them on improving connectivity. But I agree with the question you asked about the user themselves um, when they are poor connectivity. So that is something we'll continue working with them, with the service providers, and saying, and other parties, you know, the government is also doing public Wi-Fi, mm. would that help over reliance on mobile when you're attending court? So we are looking at, as the Chief Justice has said, is multiple doorway access to justice. So we don't only limit ourselves to a few solutions. Mm. Uh, if something is working, if if a school is working very well and can be a place for people to take uh, to have access to good connectivity, then we can see how we can work on that. Mm. Yeah. And that takes us back to uh, the Uduma project, which you are aware of. Yep. It's, it's in court, so I cannot discuss much about it. But the idea, you see, the idea for Uduma was to make sure that we have um, those litigants who have no access to even a computer. Mm. You see, we have 52 Uduma centers across the country. Um, I know they are working on 23 more. Mm. And then we have other initiatives by the MPs at the constituents, constituency innovation hubs. Mm. And we're trying to make sure that we, we collaborate with these different government agents to make use of all of them. So the idea was um, we have 137 stations. Why don't we then partner with other established government um, places where we can actually set up desks and um, provide the resources that are needed so that if you truly have a problem with connection, connection, connectivity, or even a problem with a gadget, all you need is to walk in, um, you'll be granted access, 
and you can do whatever you want to do from there you can file from there but i know is a is an area that has faced some challenge we mm. of course the stakeholders are still discussing but once we finally agree on the way forward that again will help a lot a lot of our litigants lastly we are trying to make the system very simple so that you can use them on your phone we you will soon we launch a mobile app initially for the small claims uh, but uh, later for the entire judiciary so that other than you having access to a laptop or a computer uh, a larger population right now has access to a smartphone mm. again that will become another option and i'm sure when you combine all these avenues then i can say even for the marginalized even for the very vulnerable in some way will be able to capture above 90% of them it's a journey we must make the first step improve by time yeah. how, how do we ascertain that all the judiciary officers who interact with this system actually are ICT compliant and that they actually know what to do with the system and that they can benefit from it so that they want angels to benefit from it there's there's a lot of stakeholder internal and external stakeholder engagement going on mm. so we we are constantly talking to our judges training them uh, to our judicial officers even to our own staff mm. and um, you find that most courts have an ICT officer attached Uh, we also working very closely with the uh, with the courts we have uh, a deputy de- uh, registrar in charge of automation to just help us as peter said we have the icms committee just to make sure that this message is communicated and judges even where possible are given personalized attention taken mm-hmm. through the system so that they bo- and i can tell you our judges are compliant the compliant if you look at what the court of appeal is doing uh, since 2020 they have never ga- gone back to do, to be a physical court <laughs> they work and and they're all virtual now they work yes. uh, supreme court works virtually mm-hmm. uh, the high court and all the other courts. so the judges are really on board um mm-hmm. and they're not um, the, the skills are good they can use computers they're very good yeah, so they're not too analog eh? training no no it's just Karanja, constant cyber uh, attacks yes How have you guarded against cyber attacks? I mean, can you even say that you are attack proof? We can't say we are attack proof because we have survived um since 2020. Mm. But I think Peter mentioned it's it's a constant fight just like no more, you know, it's security. Mm. So we have a team, very robust team which their work every day mm. is to monitor our systems is to protect our systems and to say that there are gaps here so we have an internal cyber security team and we also work closely with the national cyber security team so if you look at the issue that happened with the attack on new citizen yeah. yeah our team are working very closely and our system was able to continue working during that period so without going to details because of the nature we have a very robust team which assures us that that system is up and running every day mm. they monitor they look out for new attacks and make sure that it's working and also just providing these redundancies uh, in terms of data center in terms of systems even in terms of personnel you have redundancy on that yeah somebody says what happens to the files once a case is concluded i've been acquitted i've been charged i've been what happens to that file it follows the normal court process there's already an established process on archiving of cases mm-hmm. there are is there is there are laws around that so even when we digitize the same applies uh, how long do we keep a case so we just now digitally archive the cases mm-hmm. but because you know there is this process of appeal the case should still be available in case it's needed for appeal okay yes. Very many positive comments coming in on social media and I've just got to read a couple of them. Uh, yeah. Someone says we recognize the people who are trying to make a change in our systems. It's commendable. Uh, kudos to the, the judiciary. I've been a beneficiary of virtual court proceedings. Um, at least I'm hearing something positive coming from the judiciary. Kudos folks. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing and thank you for joining us today to basically take us through what this digitization of court processes is doing and how it's going to increase access to justice. The two gentlemen in the studio this morning, Peter Chalo, Director of ICT at the Judiciary, and Josphat Karanja, the Deputy Director in charge of ICT operations at the Judiciary. Social transformation through access to justice the digital way. Keep it here for more conversations. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.